was known as the Sword of Allah, one of the greatest generals in history, one of Islam's greatest heroes. His name, Khalid ibn al-Walid. Sunnah Followers presents a new series presented by Ustad Mukhtar Shahid. Coming soon, so stay tuned. Streaming on all major platforms. Channel Sunnah Followers. And alhamdulillah, I, I would hope by now um, people can have a, 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 a good understanding as to why he would be called the sword of Allah. And we uh, went uh, in detail uh, in the battle of Yamama. And this is the battle of the apostate uh, Musaylama. And this is, I would say, probably one of the greatest threats of apostates that the Muslims had ever faced. This individual was extremely um, he was uh, he was intelligent. He was um, uh, uh, almost demonic like. And with Washi, before Washi killed him, he said that his face actually looked like it changed. And we know that um, last week when we talked, when Khalid tried to talk to him to try to draw closer to kill him, when Khalid was giving him some kind of um, uh, demands. And it said that Musaylama turned his head this way where he was listening to a shaitan. So it's alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted the Muslims victory against this person. And prior to them fighting, um, Musaylama in what would be called the Garden of Death, where a lot of Sahabas got killed and even more so of the enemy got killed, they run into a person by the name of Muja'a. Now, Muja'a was one of the right-hand men of Musaylama. He had gone out earlier, him and about 40 men had gone out to go deal with some other type of tribal feud, and they come across Khalid's men. And Khalid, alhamdulillah, he ends up getting them. They have him as a prisoner, and Khalid doesn't kill him because he looks at it from the standpoint, he knows what this person's status is, and he could be used as some kind of, um, you know, uh, leverage you know later on possibly and alhamdulillah the muslims at one time were losing this battle to the point where musaylama soldiers had got into the muslim um camp and was stealing things and taking stuff and layla who was khalid's um new wife was there and this person mujahid actually protected her and so alhamdulillah um musaylama is dead by the hands of Washi and Abu Dajana finished him off by cutting his head off. And Khalid now is walking um, amongst the dead. And it's a horrible, it's a horrific scene. It's twisted, it's dead bodies everywhere. They twisted all of these things are, that they're looking at. So he takes Muja'a with him. He's still kind of in chains. So he takes him and says, listen, point this person out. Who is this individual? Who is this person? Who is this person? And so what Mujaha says to Khalid, he said, yes, you won a victory. And he said, but you should know that you only fought a small per portion of Banu Hanifa and that, um, and that the major portion of the army is still at Yam Al Yamama. Okay. So Al Yamama is a big, huge, they have a big, huge fort there. And he tells them like, look, you only basically scratched the surface of uh, fighting the uh, uh, battle Hanifa. And so Khalid says to him, may Allah curse you. He said, what are you saying? He said, I suggest that you accept a peaceful surrender. And if, uh, if you will state your terms, then I'll go into the fort and try to persuade the army to lay down his arms. And so Khalid, um, it didn't take long for him to, the, to realize that this was something that uh, was going to be a major issue. They just fought with a heart and a soul. And now he's telling him, you only scratched the surface. There are a whole, oh, the people that you fought um, was only, they just came out in haste because they heard that the Muslims was coming, but the greater forces is behind the fort. And so he goes and he says, look, I may be able to say something to them. So let me go and say something. So Khalid says, listen, let there be peace. He goes to Maja and says, look, 
He looking out. They've been fighting like crazy. I don't know if anybody's ever been to a fight in, in, in their life, but it's not like the movies. You know, two minutes. The average fight is about 90 seconds. OK, so they're fighting with swords and lances and spears and all kind of different stuff. And they've been doing this for a couple days. So the terms of sur uh, the surrender was worked out by the two leaders and the Muslims would take the gold, the swords, the armor, the horses of uh, Yamama, and only half of the population would be um, captives. So um, Mujahid was released and uh, given his word that he would come back. OK, so he came he comes back to Khalid and he says, look, they don't agree with that. And they they ready to fight. And in fact, they turned against me and you can now do what you wish. So Khalid decided to take a look at the city himself. So he's looking. He's not just going to go for the word of this person. He's looking and he says, OK. He's looking at his army. He's looking at them. They got to bury the martyrs. Um, they gather in the spoils so it could be uh, distributed amongst themselves and sent back to Medina. And as he got to the northern wall in the fortified city, he was he stopped in amazement. And the battlements were crowded with warriors whose armor and weapons had glistened in the sun. OK, so he's looking and he sees that it looks like it's a bunch of people up there and that he could see the, the shields. And the weapons glistening from the, the um, from the reflection of the sun, and his men were in no um, state to fight, and they had to rest. All right. So the Muja, uh, so the voice of Muja, uh, he breaks his silence and he said, "Well, you know what? They might be prepared to surrender if you don't agree to enslave any of them, or uh, or um, you could have all of the gold, the swords, and the horses." Okay. So everything stands. Instead of taking half as captives, don't take anybody as captives. Okay? And, and he said, have they agreed to this? Asked Khalid. He said, I have discussed the matter, but they gave no decision. Khalid was prepared to go so far, but he wasn't going to go any further. So we know that uh, Khalid is not a person who is going to take a weak position, you know, but he's intelligent. And you don't go sending tired soldiers off to fight a whole fresh new battalion of people. So he told him, he said, look, I'm giving you three days. If they don't agree with that, if they don't open those gates after three days, it don't make a difference what happened. We coming in there and we handling business. That's my words. So Mujaha again, he goes into the fort and then he returned this, this time with a smile on his face. And he said, they agreed. So the pact was drawn up and it was signed on behalf of the Muslims by Khalid. And the other half, Muja'a signed on behalf of Banu Hanifa. So when the pact had been signed, Muja'a returned to the fort. And soon after, when the gates were flung open, Khalid, he goes into the fort. He rides into the city and expecting to see all of these armed warriors and, 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 and soldiers. He saw nothing but women, old men, and kids. And he looked. And he looked at Mujah and said, where are, all the, where are the warriors that I saw? And Mujah pointed at the women. He said, those are the warriors that you saw. And he said, when I came to the fort, I dressed these women in armor and I gave them weapons and made them parade in battlements. And they are no warriors. So he was, Khalid was angry. And he said, you deceive me. And Mujah shrugged his shoulders like, hey. They are my people and I couldn't do nothing else. So Mujaha, I got to give him his credit on that one. He, he played Khalid really good and he was thinking with his mind and he was like, I got to look out for my people. I did it by any means necessary. So Khalid um, would have actually torn that agreement and tried to kill Mujaha. But mashallah, we Muslim, we respect um, the terms of uh, our promise. We made a promise. And we made an agreement and we respect our agreement that we made. MashaAllah. We don't break agreements. So Battle Hanifa. So those who are in the city was only safe. But if uh, and then they could come out. So they end up they came out and they could roam through their neighborhood freely. Nobody was going to mess with them. So <clears throat> a day or two later, a message arrives from um, Abu Bakr. And he wasn't aware 
of what happened at the battle at the end of the battle of Yamama. He's thinking they still fighting. So he instructed Khalid, he said, kill every last apostate from battle Hanifa. And Khalid wrote back and told him, look, a mirror, uh, um, uh, um, successor to the Prophet وسلم, we can't do that. We already agreed to a pact with them and we can't do that. Okay. But the pact had only applied to the people who were in the fort. Because remember, when the Muslims had um had broke Musaylama's um rank, a lot of them started fleeing in other areas. So some of them didn't even go to the Garden of Death. A lot of them end up fleeing in all kinds of different directions. So this pact only had an impact on the people who were in a Yamama in that fort. Okay. So everybody else was basically fair game. And so the uh the warriors amounted to more than 20,000 men were moving around um in groups and clans. So these are the people that escaped because if I'm not mistaken, we said Musaylama had about 40,000 um uh people with him. So 20,000 of them all went fleeing. So after Musaylama's death, a uh, death, they didn't pose a real danger like they did before. This person who they believed was a, a prophet and messenger, they realized that he they was duped. They realized now for a fact that he was lying. And therefore, they didn't necessarily have anything to believe or to stand on. And what happened? They fought against the Muslims and now they're running for their life. So even though physically they couldn't make the impact in terms of danger that they had done before, but now it could be a problem where they could also hype other people up to fight against the Muslims and they can cause um, some mischief, basically. And this is what happened when we saw with um, Abdullah ibn Ubay. When he was left alone, he was always trying to cause mischief by going to other people who he thought was against the Muslims and try to hype them up in order to do something. And then when they would do something, he would abandon them. He did this on several different occasions. And so therefore, what um uh, uh, what uh, Khalid had done that he had the uh, Muslims arranged in battalions and their job was to go and to find um where those people had run to and subdue them their capture and kill whoever resisted and um they fanned out in the countryside in order to find these people so thousands of them remained unrepentant and defiant and they were attacked and the Muslims wiped them totally out. And their women was taken as captives and um and the fugitives were sought out wherever they had taken shelter and eventually all the survivors had re-entered into islam alhamdulillah so once again brothers and sisters this is not about money this is not about riches and oppressing people this was about guiding the people to the truth and when those people wanted to go back to those barbaric savage ways in which they used to do prior to Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not having that. And so therefore those people were considered renegades, they were enemy to the state, they were enemy to humanity, and therefore they had to be dealt with, okay? So Khalid, he sets up his headquarters near Yamama and he stayed there for about two months. <clears throat> he wanted to know what was uh, his next military move waiting for, um, uh, Abu Bakr to send him note as to what he wanted him to do. Also, subhanAllah, I mean, you just, you defeated these people who are extremely rebellious. It makes sense for you to, to lay amongst them for a minute to kind of um, see what they, if they sincerely repented, if they were going to try and do something else. And so 60 days, mashallah, 60, 58 days is a good enough time to kind of get a pulse on what's going on in that particular area. Okay. So with the successful conclusion of the Battle of Yamama, most of Arabia was freed from the mischief of apostasy. And there was still some on the fringes of the peninsula, but it wasn't a serious threat like it had been before with Al-Aswad and Tuleha and Sajjah and um, uh, uh, Malik uh, ibn uh, Nuwayra and Musaylama. Okay, so these tribes these were people who might have been maybe 500 this they pose no threat and then what is happening more people are reverting back to islam they repented for what they done and a lot of them ended up becoming good muslims so we know that tuleha was an individual who had said he was even a prophet and he was receiving revelations from allah and uh he repented for what he had done and he had ended up 
actually dying fi sabilillah in the cause of uh, Allah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the um, battles when they were going into Qadisiyah. And it's in the, in the other place he died starts with the N. I can't remember um, the name. But by crushing the forces, the superior force of Battle Hanifa led to um, nobody uh, coming up like they did, like Musaylama tried to. Okay. So half a century later, it said with well, the old men would, would talk to their grandchildren. And the, the claim to fame for them was that I was at Yamama. So this was a, a great historical battle, and it was an honor for the Muslims to have fought against um, the, the enemies of Islam in this particular battle. And they would go in detail about what happened. And even, mashallah, Washi, um, he, I believe, moved to Syria eventually. He lived to be very old, and he was like a, a tourist attraction. And they would ask, everybody knew that Washi was responsible for killing uh, Musaylama, and he would give his recount of how he did it. You know, alhamdulillah. So this was an honor for the Muslims to have fought in Yamama and to be victorious, you know, for all Islamic history. So the Muslims suffered lightly in comparison to the apostates. But um, 1,200 Muslims fell as martyrs. And most of them were in this, in this wadi, okay? And this, this valley or this, this garden of death, a lot of them ended up um, dying in this in that particular section, and half of the loss was suffered by the Ansars and the and the Muhajibs. Subhanallah. These are the most revered companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of the 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 in, in America we would say uh, the OGs of Islam. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so these are the people who have been with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam almost probably in every single battle was with him all the time and mashallah a great deal of them had ended up um getting martyred in this particular battle of yamama so it said about 300 of the companions that knew the quran by heart ended up dying in this battle and um we know unfortunately our brother abu dajana he gets killed um abu hudayfa this is um utba ibn rabia's son um, who Hamza had killed in the Battle of Badr, um, and Zaid, who was the brother of Umar ibn al-Khattab. So these are people who was the originals of Islam. They converted to Islam in the very beginning. And, and Salim, and Salim was another uh, noble companion. He was the, at uh, one time, he was a slave of uh, 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 Abu Hudayfa, and Abu Hudayfa, before it was outlawed to adopt or change a person's name, you know, in terms of adopting his son, he used to be his adopted son, but they were like this with each other. And then they both ended up getting killed in that um in the Battle of Yaman. And this is what led to the Quran being put actually in a book form because there were so many of the Sahaba that had memorized the Quran that they were getting killed in these bat in this battle of Yaman. Okay, and also other battles dealing with the apostates, this people who had knew the Quran were starting to get killed. Okay. So when Abdullah returned um, to Medina, he went to pay respects to his father. This is Abdullah ibn Omar. This is Omar ibn al-Khattab's son. So he looked, and he's looking for his brother. And he said, why were you not killed bes beside your uncle? And he said, Zayd is dead, and you, uh, you live. Let me not see your face again. Now, of course, this is a... a, a, a uh, you know, what we say is like a, a um, figure of speech, like basically get out of my face. You know, he was upset and he was extremely. And later on, even as he becomes the caliph, he all he thinks about his brother a lot because his brother had become Muslim before him. He ends up getting, you know, martyred and that kind of thing. And he missed he he had a great deal of love and respect for Zayd ibn al-Qatab. OK, so he says, so Abdullah says to him, my uncle asked for martyrdom and Allah honored him with it. I also sought it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't attain it. I didn't get it, all right? And so on the day of the city of Yamama, it, uh, they opened his gates. Khalid, Khalid sat outside of his tent in the evening and beside him sat Muja'a, okay? So once again, this is the right-hand man of Musaylama who they ended up catching. And he's not, uh, <laughs> you don't get the sense yet that he repented and for what he had done, okay? 
So they were alone. And then he then Khaled turns to him all of a sudden and says, I want to marry your daughter. So he stared at Khaled in amazement. And he could uh, didn't think he heard him correctly. <laughs> so Khaled's tone was more insistent. And he repeated, like, hey, man, I want to marry your daughter. So Mujah now realized that he was not crazy and that he heard what he heard. And um, he wasn't um, in favor of this. He says, listen, oh, he said, well, wait a minute. He said, do you want the caliph to break your back and mine also? I want your daughter. I want to marry your daughter. He repeated it again the third time. And on that evening, he married the daughter of Mujaha bin Morara. Okay. So a few days later, Khalid receives a letter from Abu Bakr. And he says, oh, son of the mother of Khalid. Now, why did he say this? Because Khalid's father, his name was Ibn Mughira. Ibn Mughira was a, uh, a prolific enemy to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even talks about him in a bad way in the Quran. And it's the same thing when Abu Bakr had reproached Ikrima, he called him and made reference to his mother and not his father who was Abu Jahan. Okay? And so he says to him, you have a time to marry women while the courtyard of blood with 1200 muslims is not yet dry and when he read the letter Khalid murmured he said this must be the work of basically he accused omar ibn al-khattab of of hyping up the caliph about what what he had done this is something that's not surprising um you have some of the most prominent companions people who you loved they were your brothers in Islam, and they were extremely close to each other, and they're dead. And he's looking, and Abu Bakr is like, I mean, you know, our, our guys just got killed. I mean, if you got time to marry somebody, that was his thing. So Khalid, um, Allah knows best if he had been expecting such a reprimand from the Khalifa. And the messenger um, of the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he wasn't necessarily phased by the, the angry remarks that he had read in, in, his, in Abu Bakr's letter. So he remained confident that he didn't do anything wrong. So in order to clear the air with Abu Bakr, he sent him a reply, which he defended his actions. And it had the following points. Number one, only after he was certain that the complete victory had been achieved against the enemy, that he began the process of securing Muja'a's daughter's hand in marriage. Number two, through the marriage, Khalid became the in-law and one of the chieftains of Banu Hanifa tribe. The act would, if anything, have a positive impact on the members of Banu Hanifa tribe. And this is true. A lot of a lot of issues would be would be quelled. We talked about this even in, in America. We have big we have big gangs here. And if a top-ranking member of one gang's son married a top-ranking member of another person of the, the opposing gang's daughter, and they had children, the likelihood it would have more of a, a, of a result of them trying to be peaceful for, with each other because they don't want to hurt, the person don't want to hurt the son, the person don't want to hurt the daughter, and they definitely don't want to hurt their children. OK, and so therefore it only made the situation better between Banu Hanifa and, and, and the Muslims because Khalid represented Islam 110 percent. OK, he didn't go. Number three, he did not go to great lengths to get married to Muja'a's daughter. And it was simply a matter of him proposing and Muja'a accepting his proposal. And um, number four. His marriage to Muja'a's daughter did not violate either the laws of Islam nor the norms of the conventions of Arab um, customs either. Number five, to have to uh, uh, have avoided marriage on the account of being sad because of the death of many Muslims would not have made much sense. Since sadness is an emotion that has no practical application in everyday goings on of life, and it can neither keep the living alive nor bring the dead back to life. SubhanAllah. This goes to show you how intelligent Khalid is because, and, and how much of a soldier he is too. Because that's definitely a soldier mentality. Look, I mean, I'm not supposed to basically, 
I'm supposed to not get married or do something that's lawful because people are dead. That's that's what he's saying. Number six, he didn't consider any endeavor to be more important than jihad, fisa bilillah. He fought with every ounce of energy he had inside of him, doing everything that he could in terms of placing himself in harm's way to achieve martyrdom. Now he did all of that. He could uh, he could achieve martyrdom. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for him to survive the battle, then he would prevent him from getting married. <laughs> Beautiful response. Number seven, by agreeing to a peace treaty with Muja'a, he was doing everything in his power to do what was best, not for Muja'a, but for the Muslims. Furthermore, Muja'a was one who was guilty of deception. Khalid being a mere mortal, and inside of Yamama's fortress. After all, he did not re, uh, rely merely on Muja'a's word. He also based his assessment of the situation on the many soldiers that appeared to be gathered on the roof of one of the fortresses. In short, he was deceived, but that was more than anything else caused by the cunning of Muja'a. Therefore, Khalid radiallahu an, felt that he should be excused in this manner but even if he was deceived, what happened in the end was the best thing for the Muslims. Muslims gained control of Banu Hanifa's land, and many of Banu Hanifa returned to Islam. So, alhamdulillah. So when Abu Bakr, when he reads Khalid's letter, it softened his stance a little bit. And he was further encouraged to excuse Khalid when a group of men of Quraysh, they stood up and they defended Khalid radiallahu an. And said one of them, his name was Abu Burza. And he said, O Khalifa of the to the messenger of, of a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khalid is not a man who can be described with the qualities of a coward nor being treacherous. He did his utmost to achieve martyrdom. He was patient until he achieved victory. And agreeing to a truce with them is something that he wanted and regard that he was not wrong. Also, you should remember that when he saw a group of women in the fortress, he thought that they were men. And Abu Bakr replied, you have spoken the truth. What you said better excuses Khalid than the contents of his letter. Abu Bakr reaction, Abu Bakr's reaction to both Khalid's letter and Abu Burza's comments put all of this to rest. So he was cleared of any wrongdoing and he remained true to his cause. And at the same time, he had every right to marry Muja'a's daughter, subhanAllah. So one more thing about Khalid in this situation. <clears throat> he was an ex extremely effective military man and he never underestimated his enemy. Now remember when they got ransacked at the uh, the Battle of Hunayn, they came and they surprised them. He said, inshallah, that would never happen to him again. So he was extremely cautious as to any type of trick that the Kufar would try to play on him. So when he would go into a situation, he never underestimated his enemy. He always took extra precaution and, and overthought. So he gave the credit for their good qualities. So for instance, he acknowledged the bravery of Battle Hanifa. And he said, I witnessed the enemy advancing 20 times. I never saw people more patiently enduring the blows of swords, nor did I ever encounter a people who knew how to use swords better than they did. And I never witnessed a people who were more steadfast on the battle, battlefield than were the children of Hanifa on the day of Yemen. That day, because of many wounds, which I was afflicted with, I wasn't able to move. And I reached a point where I lost hope that either he was going to become killed. That's how serious it was. That's how, that's how good Battle Hanifa was fighting. He figured he was going to die when he fought against them. So when a delegation from Banu Hanifa visited Medina, Abu Bakr said to them, let us hear some of Musaylama's Quran. <laughs> the conflict was over and Musaylama was dead, of course. So the people of Banu Hanifa, they repented and they, uh, you know, was feeling ashamed for what they had done. And they said, you know, you know, Khalif, were you not, you know, excusing us for doing that? You know? And, you know, we was wrong. So he said, no, you got to do it. I want to hear it. So he said that what he used to say to us 
O frog, daughter of two frogs, neither water do you spoil, nor a drinker do you prevent from drinking. Your head is in water and your tail is in the mud. And Musaylama claimed that these words were part of the Quran that was revealed to him. And it's related that after that, a number of other similarly ridiculous sayings. And Abu Bakr said to them, he said, woe upon you. What low places did your mind manage to take you? How could you, how could you fall for that? You know, and he said all the crazy stuff. He said something to Sajan and got her, talked her out of the, her stuff, you know, and got with her. You know, but the Muslims, when you compare that kind of uh, garbage to the words of Allah, so the pure, beautiful words of the Quran, then it's something that's that's sad and laughable at the same time. Okay, so we remained at an apostasy, and less uh, vital areas of of Arabia, it was rooted out, and the Muslims uh, had a well uh, planned campaign, and this rooting the uh, the the apostates out took about five months. Okay, so Amr bin Aus, um, who was sent in another part of the, the a region on the Syrian border, he ends up, um, he was supposed to deal with Khuzara and Wadia, Wadia. And um, it was a large, it was a tribe called Kalb. So while Khalid was fighting in Central Arabia, Amr struck at the apostates in the north. Okay, and so this is just a, a, a combined effort as to the, the Muslims um fighting you know uh rooting out the apostasy in this area okay so now we get into the invasion of iraq and um the fort of nujam it was the last stronghold um of the apostates and it fallen to the muslims in like february of 633 okay so soon after abu Bakr, he writes to Khalid, who was still at Yamama, and he told him to go to Iraq, okay, and start an operation in a region called Ubala. And he told him to fight the Persians and the people who inhabit their land, and your objective is Hira, okay? So just to kind of give a little bit of background, the Persian Empire was unique for a lot of different reasons. It was the basically the first true major empire in history that spread across, um, I want to say, Achaemenians and from northern Greece to the west of Punjab in the east. And it was unique because its length of time, it flourished from the 6th century BC all the way to the 7th AD. And, but there's a gap that was caused um, by the Greek conquest. But for the most part, they ruled for hundreds and hundreds of years. So no empire in history lasted as long and had the greatest force of culture and civilization and military power like the Persian Empire. And um, it had known reverses, but after the reverse, it had risen again and characteristics of glory and brilliance. OK, so you're talking about a major empire. Now, it's amazing. You have these people a little bit less than 30 years ago were in the desert no uh no guidance allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings islam they were divided and islam now they made them a force to be reckoned with okay they have fought all of the tribes they've got they've gotten with all of the jews they've gotten with all of the other tribes they've gotten with the apostates now they're getting ready to fight one of the baddest empires in history Okay, so between um, these two rulers, there was uh, uh, Sharia and and Yaz Durich. You got to and we got. I'm, I'm apologizing. I know a little bit of Arabic, but these are Persian names that we're getting into, and so I may um, uh, mispronounce some of their names. But there were about eight rulers in a period of about four or five years, and they included two women. One's name was Buran. And the other one's name, it starts with an A, as as uh Azimir Dukt. Um, but both were daughters of Khoros Par uh Parwas, Parwes. Okay. So the first of these was Buran, who proved wise and a virtuous monarch, but lacked the strong hand that was needed to arrest the decline 
of imperial affairs. So the woman at first she had did this particular woman Boron had did pretty good, but she didn't have the power. You know, she dealing with men, and so she didn't have the power to necessarily deal with the the major affairs in, in the empire. And so um, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard of her coronation, now this is obviously she was the ruler during the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Rasulullah knew everything that was going on around him, right? And so when he heard about it, he says the famous hadith, a, a nation will never prosper that entrusts its affairs to a woman, okay? Sisters, don't get mad at that. It doesn't mean a woman is beneath or below or none of that other stuff. It doesn't mean that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had men become the, the protectors and maintainers of women, not the other way around, okay? So that definitely goes for you leading a nation, all right? So Iraq was not a sovereign state. It was um, kind of a little bit less than that. It wasn't merely a province. It was considerably more than that. And Iraq was a land one of of one of the Persians empires. Okay. So it's not like the big, huge thing that we see now. The Persian empire was huge. So Iraq was a small part of the Persian empire, but it was extremely important part of the Persian empire. Okay. So it was not, uh, it was considerably more than that. Like I said, so it was Western and Southern parts and it was, uh, and it was part and get into Arab land. Now, remember the Persians had kind of settled themselves in Yemen as well. And some of the descendants of the Persians had actually ended up converting to Islam and they had ended up fighting against Al Aswad. One of them was uh, Al Aswad's wife who he forced to marry him. And a, another a brother who was of Persian descent had killed Al Aswad, okay, in Yemen. So they had already, they kicked the Abyssinians out. And this is the Abyssinian group that came to destroy the Kaaba. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about Surah al all right? And so the Persians had kicked them out and had been ruling in that area for a good period of time. And some of them had become Muslim in that area um, and, and, and held down Islam in that area of Yemen. So a land of, it was a land of culture, of wealth, abundance, and Iraq was the most prized possession of the Persians. And so to the Arabs from the barren wastes of Arabia, it was a green jewel. It was a land of milk and honey, a, a, a big, humongous difference between the desert of Arabia and the, and, uh, the, and the, the, the land of Iraq, okay, which had the Euphrates and the Tigris. And um, these is the greatest known um, rivers, okay, north of, of the Nile, all right? And so these rivers didn't flow as they flow today. And the cities of Iraq is not like it was like it was today. So Kufa and Basra didn't exist. And this was they were founded around the 17th year of Hijri. All right. So Baghdad was a small, much frequented market town on the west bank of the Tigris, where the glorious cities of uh Tesaphon and Hira are now turned to dust. So these places are not. Where the Muslims had come, they don't even exist to this day. Okay. So the land occupied by both the Persians and the Arabs, but they were ruled by a Persian court. And the empire had begun to have a form of uh, uh, decline politically. So a lot of the, the, the generals, a lot of the emperors, a lot of the, the people, they were all doing a lot of backstabbing. It was a lot of infighting. The, the generals were fighting amongst each other, trying to become powerful more powerful than the other general. So they had this kind of um, problem. But the military effectiveness of the empire still remained strong, okay? And it remained like that for, for decades. And um, when the Muslims were going to fight them, their military was not weak. So the Persian soldier was, best, was the best equipped warrior of that particular time period. So he wore a coat of mail that had a breastplate, his head rested a helmet, either chain mail or beaten metal. His forearms was covered in, in uh, metal sleeves. His legs were also had like metal guards over like his shins. He carried a spear or a javelin, a sword or either an axe, or they had this iron mace. It was like a, a, 
like a long stick with a big ball on the end. And that thing was was vicious. You get it was kind of short. So it wasn't like uh like a base a long baseball bat or nothing like that. It was kind of a short where you could swing it real good. And if you can get a, a good velocity and you can crack somebody's dome real good with that. Okay. And so one of the problems though is that they had so much stuff on them they weren't able to move really fast like the muslims could all right the muslims didn't have none of that stuff they might have had like a piece of leather on in the front you know they had the turbans on they had these swords so where they had all of this protection but the muslims made up in terms of being able to have speed so muthanna is uh, another great um military general and um he was the chief of the tribe of Bani Bakr. So it's not, um, we don't have any, uh, he may have become Muslim during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a year of delegation, but his tribe had, you know, become accepted Islam on behalf of his tribe. But it's, um, it's, it's, it's doubt if he ever had met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or seen him personally. But so, his, um, his, his conversion is somewhat of a mystery, but he was part of this Bani Bakr, and he was a very um, enthusiastic general for Islam. Okay? So shortly after the Battle of Yamama, Muthanna turned his attention towards Iraq. And um, he approached Abu Bakr, and this was early, around 11th year of the Hijri, and he painted this picture of Iraq being in a vulnerable state. Now, to go back a little bit, I want everybody to understand, you know, the Muslims, especially when um, the Quraysh in the Battle of Khandaq had come to attack Medina, the Prophet Wasallam said that he would never get put in that position again, where somebody would come to the doorsteps of Medina and invade them. So when the Muslims had been fighting these apostates, the uh, the uh, Persian Empire was assisting these apostates, especially in parts of like Bahrain and on the borders that that bordered their country. They were assisting them with soldiers and weapons. So it's only a matter of time. They hear that the Muslims, you know, are gaining momentum. They now a more united front than they ever have been. Okay, so it's definitely the Persian Empire was going was more than likely was going to deal with them in one way or the other because you had certain tribes that had um, allegiance to the Persian Empire. So now if those tribes are becoming Muslim, then the allegiance and that power that they had at one particular time is now gone. So it was only a matter of time before the Muslims and the Persians were going to fight. But because of the fact that they have been assisting the enemy, Abu Bakr took a great um, interest in going and fighting them. Okay, so uh, Muthanna says, appoint me as the commander over my people. So he sends um, he sends a, a letter to, with Muthanna to his people saying that he um, appointed him as the uh, as the Amir of this particular uh, expedition. OK, of this of this of going and fighting uh, these this particular part in Iraq. So. Um, when as Muthana's moving, he returned to northeastern Arabia, where he converted more tribesmen to Islam. So as he's going along, going towards Iraq, he's picking up people. Alhamdulillah, people are becoming Muslim. And so he gathered an army of about 2,000 men. And they resumed raids with great enthusiasm on these uh, Persian soldiers. So they're doing these raids on a small scale. It's not big as it's getting ready to get. So when Abu Bakr made up his mind to invade Iraq, he would have uh, he would have to proceed with great care. Number one, the Arabs had a deep fear of the Persian Empire. OK, so it wasn't like it was. Unfounded fear, the Persian Empire was a was a bad army. OK, and so he knew that in the mindset of the Arabs. It's cool when they fight in other tribes. They cool when they're doing, but now we're going against the great Persian Empire. So he understood that the that the Arabs had a fear for them, uh, and also 
of the tribal consciousness as a racial complex as a result of centuries of the Persians being in power of them. Now, who did that sound like? Okay, so in their mind, they were subject of racism and made to feel inferior to the Persians because the Persians had ruled over them for so long. Okay, so they had a slave mentality to a certain extent that defeated them even before they picked up a sword to go fight them. So in return, the Persian regarded Arabs like they was savages, they was low, they was a piece of scum. That's how the Persians looked at the Arabs. So it was important not to suffer a defeat that would confirm the, the, the strength of the Persian Empire and, and confirm the fear against them with the, with the Arab Muslims. Okay, so Abu Bakr decided on two measures. A, invading an army would consist entirely of volunteers and Khalid would be the commander of that army. Okay, so this is what he came up with. So with this view, he sent orders to Khalid to invade Iraq and to fight the Persians. He further instructed Khalid to call arms those who had fought the apostates and remain steadfast to their faith after the death of the Prophet وسلم, and to exclude from the, the expedition anybody, any of those apostates, even though they repented, even though, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them, they can't be a part of this. And I totally understand where Abu Bakr is coming from. He said, the people who was rocking with you, fighting apostates, call them back, bring them with you. But the ones that you fought, even though they repented, they can stay right where they are. They can't come and they can't be volunteers. Okay. Also, the army would have to consist of nothing but volunteers. Don't make anybody do it. And that Khalid is the commander of the army. So this is Abu Bakr's instructions to Khalid. So with this view, he sent um, uh, orders for him to evade Iraq and to fight the Persians. And he further instructed Khalid to call arms those who fought the apostates and, um, and those who didn't want whoever wishes to return to his home may do so. So when Khalid announced to his troops that the caliph had given permission to return home if they wished to do so, he was shocked at the results because thousands of the army had left and went back to Medina. So he was like, oh my goodness, he had 13,000 men with him. And by the time he looked up, he only had 2,000 men left. So he sends a letter to Abu Bakr in haste and like, look, we need some reinforcements because, you know, the majority of the army is gone. They, they, they're coming back to Medina. They're not coming with me to go fight the Persians. So when the letter reached Abu Bakr, he was sitting amongst his um, friends and his advisors, and he read the letter out loud. And so um, all present might hear what he said. And he sent for a young man. Now, inshallah, anybody have time that they can go and look up this person? His name is Aqaqa Ibn Amr. Okay? So he sends for one person. The young man arrived in the presence of the caliph. He armed and equipped for travel. And the caliph ordered him to proceed forward to Yamama as a reinforcement uh, to the army of Khalid. The companion stared in amazement at Abu Bakr. He said, are you reinforcing one whose army has left him with one man? And Abu Bakr looked at al Qaqa. He looked at him. And he said, no army can de be defeated if the ranks of this man is, is amongst them. So uh, Qaqa ibn Amr, he rode away to reinforce uh, our, uh, the uh, army of Khalid. And Abu Bakr, he sat back and he relaxed. He put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he had given Khalid this mission to evade Iraq and to fight the Persians. And he laid down a starting point for the campaign in the region of Ubala. And then he had given Khalid his objective. Hira is his objective, okay? And he had placed under Khalid's command whatever force he could muster. There was nothing else that he could do. And it was up to Khalid to accomplish his mission. And Khalid now was 48 years old, mashallah. So this is brothers who are around my age. There is no such thing that you too old to be active for Islam. It's all the way until Allah take our soul. That's when we act and we stop being active for Islam, okay? So he goes out at 48 years old and he's on his way to uh to fight in iraq and alhamdulillah we're going to go ahead and we'll stop from there um because it's getting late and i know that people have to go and pray mockrib inshallah 
So the floor is open. Bismillah. 